Compliance is a profession where people work tirelessly to make the world a better place. And there are hundreds of amazing and inspiring women who have helped the field develop into what it is today. Great Women in Compliance is part of the Compliance Podcast Network. So join Mary Shirley and Lisa Fine as they talk with women in compliance who are making a difference. Welcome to the Great Women in Compliance Podcast with Lisa Fine and Mary Shirley. I'm Mary, and today we have a very special guest, a longtime supporter of our podcast. If you can say long time, I guess we've barely been around a year. Sarah Haddon, who is the owner of Corporate Compliance Insights, a compliance-centric media outlet. Sarah is also a series regular on one of our sister podcasts on the Compliance Podcast Network, the Everything Compliance Podcast. So check that out if you haven't already. Sarah, you're the um, second quick we've had on the show with a journalism background. Will you tell us how you started out, share the next stages of your journey, and how you came to be the owner of CCI? Certainly. And first, let me just say thank you so much for having me on the podcast, Mary. I'm just delighted to be here and to be associated with, with you and Lisa and the Great Women in Compliance podcast. So thank you so much for having me. And I love that question. I, I get asked that a lot these days. And it's funny when I answer it, I tend to say what I'm about to tell you sounds like I began with the end in mind. And I didn't. Um, my journey to becoming owner and publisher of CCI didn't, I didn't start out thinking that this is where I would land. Um, about 10 years ago, I was going through a major life change. As happens to many of us in one way or another, I was suddenly single. And I had two sons who were in middle school. And my professional background was journalism. I'd been a newspaper reporter mm -hmm. and later a PR professional. And I'd even done just a little bit of local web-based broadcast news. So I had about 20 years invested in the editorial world. But, you know, in 2010, 2011, the bottom was totally falling out of traditional journalism. Mm -hmm. So a newspaper or a magazine writing job, that was not going to keep a roof over my head. So I was looking for a way to translate my then skill set into something that, you know, would, would be a good paycheck. And I stumbled into internet marketing. And I ended up being a partner with uh, another business owner. And I joined a small team that had as a client, Maurice Gilbert. He's the founder of CCI. And really a lot of people I think know this part of the story. At that time, the concept of content marketing was brand new. Um, content marketing, of course, refers to giving away your content for free making it widely available, establishing trust with your readers and building an audience around a topic area. And we did this and I came to lead this effort, but it wasn't, and this part I think is important, it wasn't as a way then really to add anything to the compliance conversation. Mm -hmm. The whole reason that we were doing this was to generate leads for Maurice because he was and is an executive recruiter for compliance officers and risk managers. And here's the fun part. This scheme, this content marketing effort totally worked. In a very short time, we were getting thousands of hits per week. Authors were coming to us to offer us their articles. We didn't have to pay for them. We happily published their content and promoted it. And we just grooved along this path for almost a decade as the publication grew and grew and grew. But then... The next part of the story is that Maurice started to contemplate retirement. And once again, that put me at a juncture. I had by then developed a marketing agency of my own on the side, words and pictures, doing web development and content creation for law firms. But Maurice was my biggest client. So it was one of those things where you have almost all of your eggs in one basket. And I realized that when he retired... I was going to lose a big part of my income and I was also going to lose my biggest and my most favorite project. So he and I looked at what we were going to do with this website and selling it seemed the most obvious way to go. But you know, Mary, by then it was kind of like a house. CCI was like a house that I had helped build and design and had remodeled and redecorated over the years. And I loved living in it and the thought of selling it to someone else was really troubling for me. Mm -hmm. I, I worked out an arrangement with Maurice, and this is kind of the part where it sounds like I began with the end in mind. I worked out an arrangement where I could continue to do the job and build the publication for another couple of years at a drastically reduced retainer. 
so that I could take on an equity stake in it. And during that time, I worked to make it self-supporting. I developed some advertising relationships and tried to use it as a, as a source of revenue for him so that when it came time to sell it, it could be completely spun off and I'd have a stake and I'd have a safety net. And when that day came, I took a deep breath and with a lot of encouragement from my sons and my mother and my now husband, Tommy, I bought the site from Maurice and spun it off and relaunched it as an independent news organization Mm -hmm. just this past year in March. So I'm returning to my journalism roots. Um, I still get to live in this house that I helped to build. And it's a huge source of professional satisfaction, but but of joy too, because I like how that part of the story ended, you know? Mm -hmm. The emotional investment for you made it, it sounds very difficult to to part with. And then when you realized your heart was fully in it, um, you decided to make that a, a proper part of your life. I love that you put it that way. And that's it. Exactly. It's business, but no, it's, it's also an, an emotional investment. And it's a reminder too, that we live our life in seasons. Mm -hmm. And I think very often we just, we don't realize we're being prepared for that next season, but I think perhaps that's what happened to me along the way. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like everything has um, tumbled out just the way it should have. And um, everything's worked out really well for you in the ensuing years after your initial juncture or or fork road that you found yourself at. I think so. Yes. (laughs) Uh, Sarah, you mentioned a marketing background um, in amongst your journey. What are your tips from a professional um, in that area on how compliance departments can best market themselves and the function to their key stakeholders? Oh, I love that. Um, Yeah, that's probably like a fresh way of looking at the compliance officer's job, you know, recognizing that, that they have a marketing role in a sense. And it's a reminder too of how much the CEO's role is changing. You know, traditionally in the past, I think their their slogan was probably along the lines of we're the compliance officers and we're not happy until you're not happy. They're the <laughs> balloon, you know they're the balloon poppers. They're the ones that go around and say I'm oh, sorry you can't do that because that's mm-hmm. a, that's against the rules but but not anymore. I think more and more as compliance is becoming integrated across the various business units in an organization the compliance officer is can, is more viewed as a strategic business partner, right? someone whose efforts can not only protect an organization from regulatory trouble or reputational harm, but someone Mm -hmm. who can create a competitive advantage for a Mm -hmm. company. And certainly someone that by contributing to the culture of a company, they're going to benefit their employees. So marketing would would come out of that then, wouldn't it? Yes, they need to market market themselves and recognize that just as a compliance program requires an integrated approach, a good marketing program requires that too. So Mm -hmm. in addition to being a good communicator, I would say developing those soft skills that help you understand your audience better. And that's what we're always talking about in marketing is who's our audience? Who are we really trying to reach with this message? What are their pain points? And how can we tailor this message so that whatever they're struggling with We're speaking directly to that struggle and positioning our solution as the right one. Mm -hmm. That's a a real marketing 101 thing, just as is, are we using the right channels to reach this audience? Mm -hmm. So if you're the compliance officer, I suppose that that would be asking yourself, is this annual internal newsletter that reminds everybody that they need to complete their training, is this getting the job done? Or is it time to consider maybe working with a vendor to develop like one of those customized training apps that we're hearing about that mm-hmm. personalizes the training experience on your on your cell phone for you and it makes it more engaging as a user? Or maybe looking at a more non-traditional model for training where you're you're having the CEO and your management participate in a role-playing exercise with live actors so that you actually get to practice how you would respond if an employee comes to you with a sensitive or a volatile experience. These are some of the non-traditional things that I'm hearing about that mm-hmm. people are doing. And to me, that, that's a looking 
at the compliance challenges with more of a marketing mind. And I, I would keep in mind too, that when you build out your team or your department, to make sure that you're hiring people that bring to the table the things that you lack. And I say that because a lot of us marketers strive to be generalists. Because we think if we can master the theories and the tools and the technology that we can get more done faster by doing it all ourselves. Mm-hmm. But you know, and I know you know this, it's, it's so much better when we partner with others and we mm-hmm. surround ourselves with people that are different, mm-hmm. different from me, diff- smarter than me, people who bring to the tables, like I said, what, what I lack. So that, that would be another marketing-minded bit of advice that I might share. Wonderful. And something that I would add to with that that's worked quite well in our department um, at Fresenius Medical Care in North America is um, our Chief Compliance Officer, Lisa Estrada, um, who I interviewed for this series earlier, Lisa put in place a marketing team, but within the compliance department. And it's essentially um, a kind of off to the side gig um, that falls along with your core compliance duties, but focuses more on some of those marketing and communications and outreach activities. So for example, our marketing team um, puts together the annual compliance week. And so for compliance officers, um, for, for, I speak for myself only here, I'm not very strong on the creative side. So to be in the environment where I get to sit with um, people who are more created within the, the department and see them thinking about their ideas and hearing them try new things, that's a really interesting and different experience as well. So while I totally agree that um, partnering with um, others who don't have uh, your strengths, for example, we partner with our own um, marketing team that's dedicated to that and specialists within the company. Um, Another interesting way that we've approached this is to put ourselves outside of our comfort zone and try being the team of marketeers and um, challenge ourselves to try a different skill set, think about things in a different way, and approach marketing as if we were the specialists ourselves. Wow. Is, tell me, is this innovative? I mean, are other people doing it? I'm not hearing about other companies that actually have a marketing unit within the compliance department. Yeah, so Lisa would be thrilled. Um, she considers herself um, an innovation geek. Um, uh-huh. So I will be sharing that feedback with her um, that you, you commented in, in such a way. And also, um, I haven't heard of anyone else approaching this either. And I think that's one of Lisa's strengths is that um, she thinks a lot outside the box and challenges some of the conventions and norms that we're used to in compliance and tries to approach things in a really different way. And I think the marketing team, we may just be one of the very few. um, And I invite um, any of our listeners who do something similar or have another novel idea in this respect to get in touch about it because we're the only ones that I've heard of. Wow. I feel like I have my ear to the ground a bit in Mm -hmm. in PRC and I'm not hearing about that yet. So I'd love to know more about it and to share that with our audience because that's exciting. That's exciting. I I see no downside to that approach. I'm so glad you mentioned it. (laughs) Well, we can talk about that offline, Sarah, and see... (laughs) See how we can um, further develop um, some content on that to ensure that um, yeah, we've got some maybe knowledge a hot sharing topic for us. <laughs> Sounds good. And speaking of that, beautiful segue into what I was just about to, to ask you about, which is um, I know what I'm interested in, um, but I'm always curious to know is you know what's what's everyone else looking at in compliance? What's everyone else focusing on? So could you share with us what are some of the topics um, of articles that generate the most interest on corporate compliance insights historically, and then what subjects are trending at the moment? Ah, okay, great question. Um, I, I like to nerd out on the analytics, and I, mm-hmm. I do spend a lot of time looking at what's being consumed, and interestingly. A lot of the evergreen, long shelf life topics mm-hmm. that are in our archives get more traffic than anything else. Right. Just nuts and bolts type of information about how to build a quality risk management program or what is the compliance function's role in human resources, those types of things. But as far as what is the new stuff that's coming in that we're seeing our readers that we attract from social media consuming, and a lot of that is 
really about the role of the compliance officer and the job function, kind of what we've already been talking about. We have a category on the site called leadership and career. And in fact, Mary, some of your recent articles have landed in there. You've been talking Mm. about mentoring and about Mm -hmm. job hunting. And I had the privilege a few weeks ago when I was attending SCCE um, to meet some younger people that want to write about early career compliance experience, Mm -hmm. early Mm -hmm. compliance career. And I don't like to say newbies. I don't like the term newbie because that implies Mm -hmm. that someone is new at everything. And in fact, I think Mm -hmm. most of the people who are new to a compliance role are not new to the skill set. Right. The role Mm -hmm. demands. They may just Mm -hmm. be new to the title. Mm -hmm. But there are several young women that um that I met, they all just happen to be women, but three in particular that will be launched very soon on our pages that are going to be bringing mm-hmm. a very fresh perspective to what it's like as a, as a millennial or as someone who's changing careers and just getting into this role. What are they experiencing? What are they learning? And what can they share? So I'm very excited about that trending topic. And we'll update you on that as it as it develops. Fantastic. Sounds good. Excellent. So um, Corporate Compliance Insights has a lot of information that goes beyond just news stories on compliance, and it's totally free to access, as you talked about earlier. Thank you so much for that. It's so nice uh, not to be confronted with a paywall when on your site. That's one of my favorite things. Please share with our listeners some of the other features and resources on the site that they might find useful to grow their compliance knowledge. Oh, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the the lack of a paywall. That that is a thing that's not going to change. I I don't want to get into that. That's not our role. I don't want to sell memberships or or have events and that sort of thing. I, I just want to be the the go to source of news. So thanks for for touching on that. Um, as far as other resources where people can grow their compliance knowledge, we do host the Compliance Podcast Network. Obviously, we have eBooks and white papers that people share with us. Um, so I think we're viewed as a as a hub to find that kind of multimedia content. But a couple of new things that are in the works for next year, I'd love to mention these. And the one I'm perhaps most excited about is publishing. CCI through the years has published a number of ebooks for some of our very prolific authors. And in 2020, we're going to be rolling out a new imprint that will allow aspiring authors to self publish their books with us. We are able to offer in house editing services and formatting and book cover design. And we're going to be partnering with a company that can provide print on demand services for people that want to sell or give away a hard copy of their book. Like maybe they're a keynote speaker at conferences and they want to be able to have a box of books that they can share or sell. And CCI will be a place where they can go to have that asset produced with Mm -hmm. built-in production or promotion rather uh, because of our audience. So we're very excited about that. We'll be able to do eBooks and reflowable EPUB books for those that want to promote their stuff on Amazon Uh, as well as just, you know, promoting the downloadable PDFs on the site. So look for lots more publishing from CCI in the years to come. And the second thing, just briefly, is webinars. Over the years, we've partnered with a lot of the larger brands in the GRC space who produce webinars, and our role in that has just been to fill seats. We promote the registration link on the site and to our subscribers for free, and that helps the brands reach the widest possible audience for their webinars, a lot of which include those continuing education credits. But in 2020, we're going to be offering turnkey webinar production for small companies and mid-sized companies that they have something to share, they have something to say, but maybe they just need a media partner to help them reach an audience. And maybe they need the design or the technical expertise to make that happen. So we're looking for CCI as being a go-to source for turnkey webinar services as well. And I'm glad you gave me a chance to mention that. <laughs> and for, for those of us who are the audience, um, will the webinars be available on a complimentary basis? They will be free webinars and right. also on demand. So if you produce a webinar and you let CCI promote it to its mm-hmm. audience, I want my readers to be able to return to the site at another time at their leisure and download it and consume it later. That's fantastic. And you know, so many of us have really 
limited or restricted budgets when it comes to our own professional development. Um, and, you know, that just that's a, a perennial, perennial issue that goes across the globe. So it is awesome to know that you're really working hard to ensure that um, the knowledge is dispersed across the industry and that um, it's, it's freely ab available to those, even though we don't necessarily always have the biggest budget. So I think that's really cool and it's much appreciated. It's all about doing more with less, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. We all face that every day, every week in, in one way or another. Yeah, absolutely. And for those um, in our audience who may be wanting to share their subject matter expertise by writing articles for compliance publications, what are your tips to increase chances of articles being accepted for, for publication? And what are some of the hot topics that you'd like to have articles um, written on in the near future? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, the New York Times, I think, like their slogan is all the news that's fit to print. <laughs> for years, ours has basically been all the news that fits. And that's, <laughs> that's not entirely true, but through the, through the life of this website, if an article offered to us was topical and bright and coherent and well-written, we published it, kind of regardless of what it was about. Mm. But here's the thing. Content marking over time, our archives became kind of weighted down with content that represented subject matter that no one was really searching for. And our content overall, just because of our model, the way we were doing it, it became somewhat driven by vendors and brands and by their agenda. And our policy has always been the articles need to be vendor neutral. And pretty much our writers are able to stick to that. Mm -hmm. But if you as an editor, as an editorial team, if you're not charting the course for your content, if you don't have a, a content strategy in place, then you're reactive. You're just reacting to what people are sending you rather than proactively saying, this is what we want to publish. So part of the remodeling and redecorating of the, of the house this year has involved me sitting down with, with our editor, Emily Ellis, and mm -hmm. the rest of the team and deciding what are people looking for? looking into the Google Analytics and, and using the other tools at our disposal and talking to people who are, are active in the space and figuring out what's important, what stories need to be told. So we have very recently, when I say recent, I mean like in the last six weeks, announced a, a major change to our editorial policy and it can be found in the writer's guidelines on the homepage. And what we state is that when we receive a query, when we receive an article idea or an article draft or a full manuscript, we sit on it for about a week. We have a weekly editorial review meeting where we look at what's been offered to us and we receive, I don't know, a few dozen article ideas probably every week. Um, yeah, about 15 to 20, something like that. And we pick and choose. That's new to us to actually go back to a writer or to a brand and say, this is not the right fit. We'll have to take a pass. Or, as often happens, we invite that contributor to partner with us and to take advantage of our editorial expertise, and we'll work with them to get that manuscript where it needs to be. And we tell people, and I, I want to tell listeners, if you choose to submit to CCI, don't, don't strive for, for, for perfection. Don't, keep, don't let the idea of perfection keep you from submitting an article or posing an idea. Get as far along in your draft or as you're in your idea as you can and then reach out to us because we love working with writers. And our editor, Emily, in particular, she's an editing ninja. If you have had experience of letting a professional help you be your best, mm -hmm. then I would say embrace that process. And over time, I think you'll, you'll love the results. This is what we are applying to how we handle content and package it and publish it. And I'm looking forward to a more coherent editorial strategy moving forward and, and better results all around. That's great. Um, and I think there is, as you, I think, alluded to a risk that when content is, is freely available, um, it can get um, <laughs> a bit, you know, there can be a bit much yeah. um, of, of people's own agendas being pushed. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you also tend to have, like if, if there's one big topic out there, GDPR or something, for instance, mm. every single 
marketing department of every GRC related brand in the world <laughs> wants, to, wants to write an article that says GDPR is coming. Are you ready? And we went through a period where that's pretty much all we saw. It was, yeah. it was the same article over and over and over. And my deepest apologies to to anyone that we we turned that article idea down. But it, it, yeah, there, there's there's a challenge, I think, sometimes to sort through some of the vendor-driven offerings to mm. find the real gems. Mm-hmm. And that's what that's what we're engaged in doing and, and hope to do it even better as time goes by. Well, I can tell you from a listener perspective, that's very much appreciated. And even though people can choose not to look at things, it does make it so much easier if what is available has been carefully curated. And it sounds like that is the approach that you'll be really looking for going forward. We will. And there's there's something else to that. You know, Mary, you and I had a kind of a pre-conversation before mm-hmm. this recording. And in my early years with the site, when it was a marketing vehicle, when it existed just to generate leads and not mm-hmm. as a new organization, I listened to my clients, I listened to my team, I listened to the bottom line, but I didn't have as part of my role the responsibility to listen to listeners mm-hmm. or listen to, to readers rather. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm applying myself to this role differently and attending conferences and becoming active on social media as CCI's publisher, I'm really beginning to get a, a stronger handle on what people want to hear about. Mm-hmm. And that's that's basic stuff, mm-hmm. but I'm late to that part of the party. And it's exciting to be there. It's exciting to say that now I'm I'm able to cast that wide net and really get a handle on who's reading us, who's advertising with us, who's reading us, who's writing for us, and where do we what direction do we need to head in? So mm-hmm. Exciting right. stuff. And I think one question some of our listeners are probably asking right now is, can we submit drafts of articles to you for consideration to be featured on Corporate Compliance Insights? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I hope that anyone listening that has even just the, the slightest notion that they'd like to share their expertise, position themselves as a thought leader, I hope that they'll visit the Writer's Guidelines tab on the homepage and take a look Mm -hmm. at it. And there's basic information there about word count and how to format and that sort of thing. But Mm -hmm. don't be afraid to just just send send an email to me or to Emily and say that you want to be involved in the publication and you want to have a voice and we'll figure out where you are and where you want to be and find a way to make that happen. Great. And would you just rattle off the email address for our listeners, please, Oh, certainly. It's my email address is Sarah with an H at corporatecompliance.insights.com. And you can find that on the website as well, corporatecompliance.insights.com. Perfect. Um, Sarah, you interact a lot with thought leaders and of course read their work um, because it gets passed under you. What are some of the key attributes that make people good thought leaders in compliance and how can some of these qualities be developed for those wanting to become thought leaders? Thought leaders, that's an interesting concept. You know, we hear that word so much and I wonder, can you call yourself a thought leader? Or do you need to be called that by someone else? (laughs) Good question. I I think it's probably the latter, but either way, what what does that term mean? A a thought leader would be someone with subject matter expertise, um, someone who can communicate with confidence and authority. I think also someone who desires to lead, to inspire others, to follow them, or, or to challenge the way people think. But I believe that you can take it a step further if you're trying to figure out what a thought leader is and say that it's the person who does all those things, but who also makes a time commitment to package their knowledge, Mm -hmm. write those articles, as we mentioned, to design a course, to take on a role as a speaker or as a presenter, which for a lot of us might require pushing through some shyness or overcoming imposter syndrome because that goal to make a contribution to the industry requires that. Um, So I think that's important, but also I think a thought leader is someone who's motivated to do those things, but it comes from a place of authenticity and integrity. Mm -hmm. You gotta be able to build a following. You have to desire to build a following, but without the express goal of selling something, without a vendor message that drives it. 
And now the result of being a thought leader, as we all know, and this is okay, is you will get more clients or your employer may well engage in more business. That's not a bad thing. But I think the motives must be pure. They must be authentic. And mm-hmm. that makes me think of, of social media just briefly. Mm-hmm. I've tried through the years to use a lot of automated tools to share CCI's content because it saves me time because there's so much of it. Mm-hmm. But you really don't move the needle on social media unless you do it as an actual human being under your own name. So mm-hmm. that that's what I mean really about authenticity. I think you have to let something real about yourself come through. And I think your motives need to be pure in order to really attract a following and build something that is sustainable. You can sit in your ivory tower all day and then think about it too, but until you implement it, it's not going to happen. And I I tell people that too. If they say, I I, want to position myself as a thought leader and I've got all these great ideas. Well, ideas are great. But you do have to actually just get started and, and do something. So I would say find that quiet place of courage inside of you and act. Um, maybe we're supposed to wait for somebody to call us a thought leader, but don't wait for somebody to invite you to be one. I think if you do that, you might well be denying the world the gift of you. Mm. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I, I'm really hoping, uh, Sarah, that from your invitation earlier um, to get started on having an article published, you're, as you said, you're not asking for perfection. You're not even asking for a completed imperfect, uh, imperfect product. You're asking for someone who's got an idea and is willing to ruminate about it further um, and then collaborate to make that finished product if if you can't yourself. And so for anyone who's got any doubts that they don't know if they're going to be good enough, if they don't know that they've got it in them, if they don't know how it's going to end, Um, just make that start. Um, There are so many people out there willing to work with you to get it done. And I'm really hoping that through this conversation that you and I are having, some people who have been sitting thinking about um, writing an article for the longest time um, and just need that extra little push to get started will be inspired to do so after hearing uh, this podcast episode today. Ah, uh, yes. I love that. I love that. Absolutely. Perfection is the enemy of the good. I think if I had <laughs> striven for perfection, I, um, I, I wouldn't be sitting here on this podcast today. There's you <laughs> got to embrace the risk and, and accept there's just going to be a little bit of make it up as you go along, fly by the seat of your pants, maybe a little sloppiness during certain seasons, but, but yeah, we'll there. Absolutely. I have been for the longest time a proponent of the standard instead of perfection of um, good enough because good enough, um, (laughs) it it gets you where you want to go and it doesn't keep you stuck in your problems because if you're aiming for perfection, you just don't do as much um, and, and don't get as much done as if you're able to free yourself and go, you know what, I did the best that I could on this and now I'm going to turn to something else that needs my attention too. Exactly. And perfect people are in, or they're they're not approachable. They don't have as many friends. No, they're they're boring. (laughs) (laughs) They're not relatable, frankly. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, this has been fun. I'm glad I got to talk about all these things, Mary. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Thank you for for sponsoring us, um, for, for always being a staunch supporter of the podcast from our very early days. I really appreciate you and the genuineness and authenticity that you bring. Um, and it's always a pleasure to have a chance to chat with you. So thank you very much. Absolutely. And thanks to your listeners. I look forward to hearing from some of them. In the future. Absolutely. Thanks, Sarah. That's all we have today, folks. Have a great day ahead. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Great Women in Compliance. We hope you'll join us in honoring the great women in the compliance field by subscribing to this podcast and leaving a review.